Well, welcome everyone. As, as Abby said, uh, I'm the AUL for scholarly communications and collections here at Iowa State. So um, with that, I oversee the collections program as well as uh, lead our scholarly communications program, which includes uh, our work around open access, open data, and uh, work with Abby uh, on our open educational resources work. So today what I'm gonna to be talking about is a, a pretty significant trend uh, in academic uh, research libraries. And that is the transition away from paying uh, for traditional subscriptions to, to, to journals, to publishers, and instead doing new agreements that are basically open access agreements. And what these, what these, the, the difference in these agreements is basically they deliver not just the ability for a campus's users to read the content, um, but it does, these new agreements will do that. And in addition, it gives um, our, our campus's authors the ability to publish their work open access under the agreements that the library is making. So this is very, very different. These agreements have been around, I would say in Europe, different versions of them for probably going on five years, but it's really accelerated just in the last few years. And I'm gonna talk through just a little bit of what we're seeing with the trends with these types of agreements in the United States, as well as what we're doing and the progress that we're making here at Iowa State. So I wanted to talk just a little bit more about the, what these agreements are. And there's actually a lot of different varieties of these, of these agreements. They're also called, they have different names. Uh, another umbrella term you will hear for these agreements is transformative agreements. And a transformative agreement is basically something that is taking that traditional subscription spend and going toward these new types of open access agreements. And the different models that publishers are using to do this um, really depend you know, on the size of the publisher, um, you know, what kind of articles and journals that they're actually publishing. So there's a lot of different varieties of these, under, these underlying models. And it gets pretty complicated, but you know the bottom line for the publishers and the challenge that they're up against is how do they take a new model that is going to replace this subscription model that's basically been in place since you know post World War II. So publishers, not just the big commercials, but also our smaller society publishers, our self-publishing societies they have really had a stable revenue flow for you know many 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 years and the relationship that they've had with the library has pretty much just been one of figuring out how to renew these subscriptions that deliver you know outsized profits to the commercial publishers but for our university presses and our, our self-publishing societies really generate the revenue for those societies to be able to do the type of work um, that the society needs done. In a lot of cases, it's the publishing revenue coming into these societies that underwrites a lot of the other things, a lot of the other work that the society actually does. So when you think about moving away, you know, as a publishing director and moving away from that stable subscription model, um, it's, it's, there's a lot to take into, into consideration. So just real quick, uh, kind of at a high level, um, I wanna just mention three different kind of buckets of these agreements that, that publishers are using and the libraries are signing on to. The first is the, the read and publish variety. And Iowa State has done several of these, including our most recent uh, read and publish agreement, which is with Wiley. And we are the only, uh, we're the first institution in the United States that has had an agreement with Wiley. It's our largest to date. We will have approximately 130 articles by Iowa State authors uh, come out open access in 2021 because of this agreement. But many other publishers are using this model. And in this model, what you basically take is you look at what a library is spending on their subscriptions you look at how much publishing is coming out of the campus, and then you put together a, an agreement that basically has two fees in it. One is to maintain that traditional subscription read access, and the other part is to cover the anticipated publishing that's gonna be coming 
uh, off of the campus. So Cambridge University Press, Oxford, um, and the rest of those that are listed there in that left group are all experimenting and piloting with this model. Now, I will say the publisher that is the farthest ahead in the United States with this is Cambridge University Press. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Cambridge, you know they're a little stronger in humanities and social science um, journals. But I was on a, uh, on, a, on a webinar with the head of open access strategies for Cambridge just a few weeks ago. And they started 2020 with about 20 libraries in the United States signed up to their new read and publish model they ended the year with over 130 and they are on track to fully transition from their subscription model to this new read and publish model um, within three years. So most of the other publishers are not moving that fast, but that's the direction things are going. The, the second model in the middle is subscribe to open. In a lot of ways, um, it's the simplest of all of them. It, it's, it's basically, an agreement between the library and the publisher that if, as long as the libraries maintain their subscriptions, the publisher will make the content open. And, and every year, the way that these, these are structured is that there is a threshold of, of subscribers that have to maintain their subscriptions. And if, if 95, 97% of the libraries all renew, then every year the, the publisher will make the decision to publish the content open. Now, the problem with a model like this is, is the free rider problem. And if you end up with you know, a significant amount of attrition and libraries dropping off, what happens with the subscribed open model is then they have the option year to year then to publish the articles coming out behind the paywall. So there's a built-in check on free writing, which is a, is a long-standing collective action problem with, with models like this. But there are a lot of smaller and kind of niche publishers that are experimenting with the subscribed open model to replace their, subscription, their traditional subscription model. And then the last one is what I'm calling, there, there's co-op models and there's tiered models. Those are two different things. Um, Iowa State worked with MIT and Carnegie Mellon and, and the UC system to actually develop the tiered open model that the, that the Association of Computing Machinery is using. And there are other publishers that are excited about that one. Um, so, you know, I think this is getting in the weeds a little bit far. But just to show that there are quite a few models, um, sustainability is a huge concern, and there is significant movement with these publishers uh, in adopting these and piloting these at this time. And then a motivation, you know, there's a couple of motivations for publishers to do this. I mean, there's, uh, if you're familiar with Plan S, that is the group of funders in Europe that have basically said, uh, the research that they fund, the articles coming out of that need to be published open access. So there's, there's that sort of funder mandate motivation to publishers. But there's also things like this. These are some numbers from uh, annual reviews. They're doing the subscribe to open model. So what we're looking at is four of the titles that they included last year in their subscribe to open offer. So in December 2019, all four of those titles were subscription. They were paywalled. If you did not have a subscription, you could not read them. In December 2020, they had opened all of this up under their new subscribe to open model. And that's the factor by which downloads increased around the world. So, you know, four, 5.6, 4.7 times the readership of their content once they opened it up. And for annual reviews, which is similar to a society publishers in a lot of ways in that they're mission driven, they want to get this content out there in order to have an impact. Um, this is a huge motivator for them to figure out how to get to open access because they have about 25 of these annual review titles and they would like to flip them all to open access. So there is broader readership of the content that they're producing. So, so that's kind of my quick external scan of things that are going on with, with the publishers and the societies and the models that they're doing. And then bringing it back to, to Iowa State, I wanted to start real quick with the library's journal negotiation principles. So before we embarked upon uh, making these types of agreements, recognizing that moving away from traditional subscription was a major change 
uh, for this library and how we're spending. Um, you know, most of you probably don't have much of a sense of the library's budget, but the uh, about half of the library's budget goes toward collections. The other half goes toward, you know, the other things that we pay for, primarily, you know, salary and benefits for staff. So we make a significant investment at this university and the library's collections. And so the library in approaching trying to take the biggest piece of that collection budget, which is our journal subscriptions, and doing something different with it, we thought we needed to come out to campus and you know, identify some shared principles for what it is that we are setting out to do. And that's what these principles are. And they're very straightforward. And we took these through our library collection groups. We took it to library administration. We took it to our faculty advisory board. And the, then these principles, we, we took them all the way out to the faculty senate where they were unanimously endorsed. And what the principles say is that we're gonna prioritize openness in our negotiations, financial sustainability and transparency. And you know, the process of getting these principles out, you know, was an education and outreach effort and it was about getting people, you know, basically our stakeholders across campus informed about what it is the library is setting out to do as we approach doing these new types of open access agreements. So this scary pie chart, which do not try and look at the, the, the tiny little numbers there, that's not the point. It's really more about the pie slices and the colors. Um, one of the things that the library needed to do, in addition to getting stakeholder buy-in and informing campus about our new approach, we really needed to think in new ways about uh, you know, how we will approach both our, our spending of this money and how we will think about um, publishing. You know, publishing has not actually been something that the library has been greatly concerned with in the context of journal negotiations. So now these new agreements are completely based upon, you know, at least in a large part on the amount of publishing that's happening uh, with the different publishers. And so what you're looking at here are the top publishers by corresponding, authored, by corresponding authors on our campus. And there's a couple things to note here. One, that concept of corresponding author. You know, that is where responsibility lies is libraries make these types of agreements the articles that we are covering are the ones that are by Iowa State corresponding authors. If you are a co-author on a paper uh, with someone from the University of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin author is the corresponding author, well, that would actually be covered under the Wisconsin agreement, not the Iowa State agreement. And this is just a way, you know, with the, you know, research being more interdisciplinary, trying to figure out who actually is responsible for covering the article. Um, that's just where this is all settled out. The, the corresponding author is where responsibility for uh, being under agreement, that's where it sits. And so just a few quick things on this, this pie chart. I mean, uh, some other things that jump out at you is that, is that, you know, we have five publishers that make up 50% of campus's publishing output. And this is not unusual. Other institutions that have done this same analysis have, have seen the same thing. And the 20, our top 20 publishers make up, you know, whatever that is, 85% of the, of the total publishing. And so the work that we did going into this, it was actually quite complicated to create this pie chart because you can't just go into Web of Science or Scopus and hit, you know, run publishing profile. Um, this was Eric Sherris at our library, our data analyst, you know, going through, you know, I don't know if he got the data through the API or how he got it, but getting that actual data down, working it, having to do a lot of cleanup in order for us to get to, to this view. And again, the whole goal is to get our arms around where the publishing is happening. So when we go into a negotiation with Elsevier or IEEE or ACS, we have some sense of the publishing that is happening uh, with that publisher. So that's a big change for us in, in looking at the data in this way. And I wanted to quickly just show, we just ran our numbers for for 2020. So these are the publishers um, that we have agreements that we had agreements with in 2020 and the number of articles that were covered under the library's uh, agreements. And you'll see a mix of, of, you know, what I would call traditional more subscription publishers. There's also some um, pure OA publishers. So like Frontiers and PLOS, you know, these are uh, publishers that were already publishing open access. But what we're doing at the library 
is we are trying to bring in and cover even those charges with the, the pure OA publishers. And that's, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. The biggest one being we're trying not to create incentives on where authors might try to publish by where we have agreements. So we want to be pretty even handed and we want to basically try and figure out how we can cover the open access publishing for all publishers, including with the pure OA. So the big change, you know, we about doubled the number of open access articles from 2019 to 2020. And for 2021, with the large Wiley agreement, we'll be adding another 130 articles onto here. So you can see that this is ratcheting up um, quite quickly as we enter into more, more of these agreements. So I wanted to talk just briefly about some of these changes at the library that this has led to for us. I talked a little bit about the data piece, the data analytics piece. Um, we have really had to ramp up our skills and how we work with data. So modeling uh, in order to do the projections on the publishing output, um, that has been really important. Another uh, significant change in the library has been around the workflows these new agreements have created. They're very different than a subscription agreement. With the new open access agreements, we actually have to do author verification. So, you know, an article goes through and is, you know, goes through the process, it's submitted, it ends up being accepted at a publisher we have an agreement with. We are then uh, interacting with the publisher through their publishing platform to actually verify that it, that is one of our authors to approve that article um, before it gets um, charged to our account, would be one way to think about it. But that's something we have never done before. So we have moved this into our electronic resources unit. We have trained our staff to work on it. Um, and it's, it's been a significant change uh, in doing new types of work in the library. Um, and of course, that has staffing implications. Um, a couple other quick things, the collaborative approach. Um, and what I'm thinking of here is the collaborative approach with the publishers and the societies. I spend a lot of my time, you know, in the past when someone in my position would have just been engaging in a transactional way with the publishers around, you know, the actual terms of our subscription agreement. What we're doing now is actually working more collaboratively with them to try and uh, figure out sustainably how we do this together and move forward into this new open access paradigm. So it's been uh, quite different uh, with our relationships with the publishers, including even with a big commercial publisher like Wiley um, than, than these relationships used to be in the past. Um, and then the last thing I will just mention is, you know, communication around these agreements, you know, doing this OA cafe and trying to talk about it. Uh, we really are, are realizing that we need to share information out about what we're doing. Uh, lots of folks are starting to see or hear secondhand, maybe that we're covering open access. And then they want to know, well, if I submit to this publisher, will the library cover it? Well, I've linked to the bottom, that's our website where we're keeping a running list of all of the open access agreements that we have. If you have not been there, I'd recommend going to that site and taking a look at it. Um, as we get new agreements, we, we add those uh, to this page. And you can reach out to myself or Abby Elder uh, as well if you have questions about any particular publisher. And then the last thing I'm gonna mention, and this could be some, uh, some points of discussion for us uh, in, the, in the, the less formal part when we move past my presentation here. Um, what are the challenges with libraries, you know, taking this new approach? Um, you know, what are the challenges that we're starting to see at our library? And I would absolutely say the, you know, the budget cuts that we're, we're facing uh, are making this a little more challenging. We did some work with the California Digital Library approximately three years ago to analyze our subscription spending and our publishing and to run projections on, you know, to what extent would the library's journal subscription spending be able to cover campus publishing. And at the time that we did that analysis, it looked like the library's journal subscription budget um, based on our, on our publishing would actually transition pretty well to covering uh, open access publishing on campus. And what we're seeing now, we the library took a six and a half percent or 6.4 percent cut uh, to the collections budget this year. It's going to be a probably a five percent cut next year. Um, we're not sure that that calculation is going to 
uh, hold up when we come out of the other side of COVID. And so when I mentioned cost shifting, what I'm talking about there is, you know, there are some publishers who we publish more with, but maybe we didn't pay a lot in subscriptions. And then we have other publishers who we were paying a lot with our subscriptions, but maybe we don't uh, publish as much with those. And so through these agreements and negotiations, what we need to figure out how to do sometimes is bring down our spend with one publisher so we can bring up our spend with another publisher. And you can imagine every conversation with the publisher where the spend needs to go up, that's a pretty easy conversation. The conversations with the publisher where our spend needs to come down, um, those negotiations, as you can imagine, aren't quite as easy. Um, so other challenges, you know, modeling and projections, so both the financial modeling and the publishing modeling that we need to do um, for these, in order for us to, you know, manage our risk and for publishers to manage their risk, um, that's a challenge just because the, the metadata and the underlying platforms that the publishers have and the, the resources that we have in order to do these projections, the data is not great. Sometimes it's hard to pin down, uh, you know, all of Iowa State's authors, you know, the adoption of unique identifiers like ORCID, and there's unique identifiers for institutions. That has all not been done. And so we have received bills, for example, for articles published by the University of Iowa. That's why we have to look at each and every one to verify that it's one of our authors. So, and then you extend that out to trying to do modeling based on this data that's not perfect. And, you know, it just leads to you know, maybe not the sharpest projections. And we, so that's a challenge. We need to be able to do more accurate modeling and projection pr projections. And then sustainable open models. I mentioned all of those models. Um, I think some of those are gonna prove sustainable, um, but I think they're gonna need to be tweaked along the way. And I know that there is probably a lot of anxiety with publishing boards um, around whether or not this, these moves are gonna prove as stable as the subscription uh, paradigm had, has proved for those publishers. And then, you know, the ongoing concern over publisher diversity and consolidation. You know, just a quick example of this would be uh, Wiley is a publisher that I, I think Wiley only owns about 50% of their journal titles. The other 50% of the journals that are published by Wiley are actually owned by society partners. And so a concern going forward is that if we can't figure out how the small societies can manage this transition to open access on their own, there is a risk that those societies will feel compelled to join under the umbrella of a large commercial publisher like Wiley perhaps. So that's more consolidation uh, in this market, which I don't think that's what we want to see. And then the last concern is publishing equity for authors. And what I'm getting at here is we are moving away from a subscription paradigm where readers did not have access to the literature. And as we move into you know, a, a new paradigm where publishing is being uh, you know, really influenced by these institutional level agreements, what happens to the authors that are in low and middle income countries where you know, there's not institutional agreements like we're doing at Iowa State? What happens if you're in the United States, but you're at an under-resourced institution uh, where there's not money to pay for the publishing? And so there are a lot of conversations going on around this transformation and how do we achieve uh, equity uh, in this transformation? So for most of you, I think all of this is new. I have a feeling I probably... Uh, went a little far down in the weeds. Uh, hopefully it all made sense. Um, but I am going to stop there and I will stop sh sharing and I would welcome any questions or comments or thoughts on uh, the overall open access uh, transition that's underway or how we're approaching it here at, at Iowa State. And I see there's all kinds of chats that were buried. It's mostly me. It's all right. <laughs> you were providing running commentary. Well, we're a small enough group. I, I think you could feel free to just unmute and uh, welcome your comments or questions. 
Uh, this sounds really great. Last time I looked at your guys' site, I think it was just Frontiers and uh, there was one other. Um, so to know that you guys now have open access for like Oxford and some of these other journals that um, I know I publish in is fantastic. And Andrew, what a, what's your discipline? Where are you at on campus? Uh, I'm in the Office of Biotech. I help a lot of faculty. Um, I run the genome informatics facility. So I do a lot of data analysis and um, so a lot of genome assembly type work. So a lot of people from biology departments and engineering and, and whatnot. Wonderful. So I, I can help spread the word. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah, and I do think that that landing page is probably, you know, our best source of information for these. Um, I didn't mention it, but we, you know, we're, we're continuing to have conversations and roll out new agreements. I think the one that we're working on next is with AIP, the American Institute of Physics. That's a license that we're working on right now. So there will probably be another two or three uh, publisher agreements added in 2021. Yeah, what are you, what, are, how are you ever, um, announcing this to the faculty? Because I mean, I, I try to read like the e-news and all this stuff and I, I did not see this. Yeah, you know, it's been covered in different, different places. You know, we've had probably a couple of articles in Inside Iowa State. Um, there was a press release uh, for the Wiley Agreement that we just concluded. It came out in the library newsletter. Um, we're trying to partner a little bit with the VPR office to try and get the bigger agreements out in the VPR uh, newsletter. But that's why when I, you know, the, that communication piece of all of this, you know, I think we'd be very open to any suggestions on how we can, you know, you know, spread the word a little better. Um, I you don't know did, if that's us. Go ahead. You mentioned that you've done all this analytics where you've identified all the authors on campus and where they're publishing. Yes. Um, a batch email with targeted specific information. Hey, guess what? This paper, this this uh, publisher is now free and open access. You can publish this in for free, and then make sure it's coming from the library at Iowa State. You know, the emails are a lot harder to get out than the people's names, sadly. Oh well, but uh, mailing we lists are very locked down on this campus. <laughs> <laughs> well, however. However, through the, the publishers know who the authors are and have uh, the email address. I think that's actually a really good idea. I think especially for some of the niche. Um, and one thing about these that, that I didn't mention is say that you are submitting to, to Oxford and you, you, know, you didn't know anything about it. it. It's a journal you would have published, you were gonna submit to anyway. When you submit and you go through that process, each of these publishers now have a workflow where at some point it it's really at acceptance. Once that article is accepted, it's gone through peer review, it, it's accepted. They will identify you as belonging to Iowa State. And then they put you down a different track in that author submission workflow where it, they have identified you, they notify you that you are covered under a central open access agreement. And then they actually give each of these um, it's pretty standard practice to default that the author is going to be published and covered open access under the agreement. But authors do have the choice in each of these agreements where they can opt out. If for some reason an author does not want their article open access, they have the choice in that, in that author workflow to actually make that selection. But you will be identified if you're submitting to one of these publishers. And, and that being said, I, I was criticizing the data that the publishers have. And so say you are submitting, you have a, a I don't even know a, a good example, but say you have a, a grad student who's making the submission and for some reason they use their Gmail, right? So then they wouldn't notice you coming from Iowa State because they're looking at that, that email domain. Right. Eventually this will get to where authors are all you know, hopefully using their ORCID, which is the unique identifier. And then they would really hone in that you are from Iowa State covered under this agreement. And we would probably have less slippage with authors that might, might you know, not get identified. And that, that's for corresponding authors, right? This is, yeah, everything here is about the corresponding author. So if you're not the corresponding author, and this is leading to some, you know, with our ACM agreement, the Association of Computing Machinery, um, they are 
ACM is starting to notice that an author will be the third author on the paper. You know, their colleague submits it from, you know, from, you know, UC Berkeley, which is covered under the agreement. Um, and what they're finding is that they're jockeying for being corresponding author based on where the agreements are. And so then after the fact, they'll say, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, this corresponding author wasn't covered under an agreement. I am. Can I be switched to the corresponding author? <laughs> so it's leading to some confusion there, which, you know, why wouldn't you do that, right? You know, if you knew it beforehand, you would have had, you know, the one who's covered under the agreement be the corresponding author. But there's a growing awareness, I think, among faculty of how these things work. And I think that will be a conversation between co-authors that happens probably more frequently going forward. The part Thank about you. that that cracks me up is that that kind of eliminates the whole purpose of what a corresponding author is supposed to be. Because now it's just who pays the bill. It's not who you should contact about the research. Right. No, but I mean, to some degree, because um, there, there are, in my domain, there are typically three main points in the authorship list that you, know, you get credit for in some academic sense. And that's the first, the last, and the corresponding. And a lot of times the last is the corresponding and you know whatever. But there's technically three spots. Um, and with being a bioinformatician, it's not, you know, like they, there was always a little bit of a, you know, should the person that's the domain expert be the corresponding author on a genome assembly paper? Or should the person that did the assembly be the corresponding author? You know, and, and in this way, there might be incentive either way. Um, but right. it, it's interesting that, that that's going to change that dynamic uh, in some sense, as you were yeah. saying. Yep, it sure will. And it's interesting, I, I didn't realize this, just how across disciplines, you know, that corresponding author, in some, there actually is a bump in stature in being the corresponding authors. And in some other disciplines, it seems like that's just the person who's handling the transaction of getting it submitted, and it's really not any bump in stature uh, being the corresponding author. So that's different across um, different disciplines. I, but it I, can also be, who do, you, who do you ask questions to? when you have a question about the paper that's, and if it's highly technical, you, you want yeah. the, the guy that did the research. I mean, sometimes it can be the first author that did all the research. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyone else on the, anyone else who? I see Jackie, Jackie, here? Jackie could speak up. Come on, Jackie. Oh, did she just disappear? Oh, there she is. No. You just oh, up here. Here with the video. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for calling me out. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the cafe. <laughs> Yay! And 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 I have my espresso machine behind me, so we're all. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm jealous. I know a real a real espresso machine. Um. Well, I mean, um, was it that, that especially for papers? Is that? just basically accessing them right now as a researcher for me because basically I'm just like Andrew I'm basically now like a glorified biomathematician and data curator so I just do a lot of number crunching and and in cases where I'm writing a paper and I need to do data curation and I contact a corresponding author um, I basically go on this you know mouse chase of trying to find the data that they have. They don't have it. Oh, if there's this um, YouTube video I, I share all the time. I can't, I have to go find it and make in the chat about the uh, uh, the bears finding the data that Lee Chin did four years ago and it was on a US, U <laughs> Megan's laughing, she knows what this is. Maybe, maybe Megan can find it and put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> um, and that's kind of like the thing I basically have to deal with is hunting down the corresponding data that wasn't put into the paper itself because there wasn't enough room. Um, and it's one of those cases where um, I, I, um, I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with the corresponding author because I know basically it's the PI or it's like the Guy, the, the main person on the grant who barely did anything, he just wants his last name on, on there to be the corresponding author. Mm. So um, it's one of those things. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Megan. You found it. Um, that 
watch it later. It's, it's about like seven minutes long, but it's absolutely hilarious. And that's basically what I have to deal with a lot. Um, but like um, one of the main things I work with is maybe a topic for um, a discussion for a different topic because I don't want to drive the cafe discussion too far away from publications right now. But I would love to kind of just ask a whole bunch of different library um, staff a oh, whole bunch of questions on how to deal with basically database subscriptions, because that's becoming the new thing. CARE, um, once it lost its funding, it went to a subscription model and basically asked libraries to pay for it. But you just stated basically, you know, mm -hmm. the budgets can't handle this. So do, do any libraries have uh, different ideas on how to help? Because like, for example, major databases that are placed for this corresponding data that they don't put in the publication, but they need to put someplace else, they can put in that database and it's there, um, they're losing funding. One of the major, um, excuse me, April, yay, yay April. Um, just for, just to tell everybody, um, one of the major human model databases, uh, Zebrafish just lost its funding. Hmm. So they don't know what they're gonna do. So and where was that? Where was that funding coming from before? Where Where did they lose the funding from? Uh, NIH, National mm. Institute of Health. Yeah. Um, and CARE was getting their funding from and um NSF. Mm. And so it's just um. And I warned CARE we weren't going to be able to afford them. I I know, <laughs> and that's just it. And like, and sorry, Meg and I, Meg and I go about it a lot. We we it's can like week. yeah. <laughs> Let's, hey Jackie, let's not... Jackie, you have a database. Can't you just kind of all that data up and and manage it? Oh yeah, but just like watch the YouTube video. I don't understand with the column on the Excel sheet that says CA means. Like they don't they don't document their work. They don't tell me what these things mean. It's like me trying to find metadata, and I'm like, no, no. I meant oh this. You said zebrafish just lost their funding. Yeah, that that's like corn. Yeah, you yeah, can just that's like corn <laughs> soybean. Sure, I'll take that. Sure, you can do it. You're great. It, you know, I, I, I don't I, think. You know the what I was talking about with the the library budget with you know to to have this happening at the same time that libraries are actually under probably the biggest uh, you know austerity uh, time that I have seen and. Iowa State belongs to kind of an expanded library consortium. It, it was the Big 12, but now there's probably 35 libraries in there called the Greater Western Library Alliance. And, and in that con consortium, we probably back in October, we did a um, just a quick survey to see what kind of budget cuts folks were up against. And Iowa State's kind of in the middle of the pack. You know, there's certainly some libraries that at least uh, this year didn't have significant cuts, all the way up to libraries that had like a 20% cut to their collections budget. So when you talk about these databases losing funding right at the time that, you know, <laughs> libraries are losing significant amounts of their, their collection money, um, there's just not like in our budget, there's we have to have a very sharp pencil because there's just not any extra money uh, for doing these things. And back to the modeling and the projecting, the projections that we're running in order to make sure that we can do these things and minimize our risk, um, it's really challenging. It's a lot more challenging than it was just, just recently. Exactly. And that's one of the things where like, there's got to be a different way to handle this. There's got to be a different way to make this sustainable. Um, and then there's actually, um, I'm part of a group that Megan knows about Agbell Data, and we're basically 35 different databases around the United States, and now two from two from um, um, Korea, um, just trying to figure out how do we become sustainable. Um, some of us, some of the databases here that actually are on campus at Iowa State are sustainable because they're sustained by the USDA, but there's a number that aren't zebrafish. You know, that I just mentioned, they're just pair. They're mm -hmm. not USDA. So just getting someone else's opinion, how do you make these sustainable? So it's, 
I don't want to take this too far off topic. <laughs> well, you know, where the, the overlap is here, right, is that, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, the over the, the more broad shift toward open scholarship and open science. And the publications are a part of it. The data is a part of it. The methods are a part of it. Um, and to me, there's, you know, it, it's a really interesting time to be involved with all of this because so much um, is changing at this time. Um, and there's there's lots of opportunities I think ahead of us, but again, you know, if you think about what some of the commercial publishers are doing with um, around the data, you know, I there's a long history of distrust between big commercial publishers and libraries, right? Because they have just beat our brains out, um, you know, on on negotiations and subscriptions for so long. So we tend to look at Elsevier and Springer, you know, we're a little skeptical of them and. And I do think that there's a lot of risk ahead with um, commercial publishers being in a position where they can step in. I'm not saying that they're going to figure out how to take over the zebrafish database, but um, I think there is some risk of that, of commercial publishers stepping into the breach here and seeing opportunities to uh, latch on to more content. Um, so. Yeah, so I see these things are all connected and we talk about open access in the context of open scholarship and open science. Um, and I think we need to have that broad view because it's all, it's all connected. If you guys wanna do an economic discussion of research funding, we can do that. I won't have any answers though. I'll just have examples. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says, oh, this is a great time to write a grant. And I'm like, yeah, you're trying to do it with your kids running around. Grant funding's not so Oh, are you doing? Well, Andrew doesn't have to write grants anymore. He's pretty, he's lucky, but. No, I just make sure I have, I, I actually help other people write grants and make sure they include funding for my lab. So it's still, but you're right. I, it, it, there's a lot less um, work involved when you don't have to be finding collaborators and, um, and trying to write the whole thing from scratch. You know, I always thought that was a smaller percentage of my time, but it turns out it was a lot of my time. So I'm, I'm uh, appreciating being out of the rat race because as soon as you get a grant, you're beholden to somebody's objectives. So the objectives that you have in the grant and um, once you hire somebody, you have to constantly look for more funds to support that, those, those staff. And so, especially with the way science funding in the US has continued to dwindle um, a lot of times you accept smaller amounts of funding to be able to have funding to be able to do the research, but that isn't always the best model to ensure the long-term stability of, of staffing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, I'm a fee-for-service facility and, you know, I like the idea of being able to have more than one potential income stream, but um, this is probably a better model at the moment for us. Because everybody sense. needs data analysis, right? I mean, there's there's still going to be lots of grants. There's still, still funding, but um, there's the data keeps the big data keeps getting bigger, and there's always more. And there's more people that we need more and more people to be able to take that data and translate it into something that's really informative for whatever problem you're working on. And although we keep training them, they get sucked up by industry and academia, and you know they're there are that there are lots of us but there are also not a lot of us i don't know how else to explain that it, it's it's challenging sounds like it sounds like it well we have a few other people on here we haven't heard from kathy jordan i'm going to start calling some folks out. i i think we'd love to hear uh any thoughts you all have what your position is at iowa state and uh any questions you might have around open access, open scholarship, open data? There's a term I learned from my, my kids with playing their video games, which is when there's like a virtual character just standing there that usually um, isn't doing so well, AFK away from keyboard, which is... <laughs> Maybe some yeah, of our folks I, I in our cafe are AFK. They just want their participation points. Like, oh yeah, we were there. See? <laughs> I took a picture. I took a screencast. See. <laughs> oh, we do have a couple people who have unmuted. So, 
Um, hi everyone, this is Adash. I, I'm a faculty in mechanical engineering, and uh, I was just interested in uh, what are the current, what is the current status of uh, uh, open access, and I think uh, um, this was a great presentation. Uh, at least I got a lot of new, new information. Wonderful. Um, with our open access agreements, are you or your colleagues publishing under any of the agreements we have in place so far? Uh, not yet. Um, so. Um, more, to be honest, like almost ninety percent of my our work goes to Elsevier journals, so and it's been a challenge to get yeah the papers and, and get get uh, get them published. But unfortunately, like uh, so, most of our top rated journals are in Elsevier. So. We we are in, you know, we've been in conversation with with Elsevier for a couple of years. They're a unique, you know, publisher for us in that, um, you know, just a couple of years ago when we were still in what we call their big deal journal package, where we were basically subscribing to all 1700 journals, Iowa State and the University of Iowa, for historic reasons, you know, going all the way back into print journal subscriptions. Um, we were priced at the very highest point of what they charge libraries for um, those large subscription packages. So as you probably know, we have unbundled and we are no longer, we, we could no longer afford um, to have all of those subscriptions. And so we have lowered our spend with them, you know, probably by 40%. But the good news of it is, is our spend is still at a point where I think it would be viable for doing an open access agreement with Elsevier. And, and I just had a call um, probably four weeks ago with their main open access strategist talking through what that might look like. So it seemed like with Wiley, it was two years of conversation for us with Wiley before we were able to figure out um, what our open access agreement would be. And I'd say we're probably another year out with Elsevier, but uh, you know, there are, they're the biggest, you know, publisher we have, you know, it's by, by a large margin. Um, so it's a priority for us to figure out how we can um, get an open access agreement with them in the, the coming, you know, year or two. Nice. I also had another question. So is there any um, um, conversation with like the nature, nature publishing group and the science publishing group to to help with the open access because uh, most of their journals are like prestigious open access journals. So like, I wouldn't mind paying them to get my paper published, but then uh, uh, like having, an, having an agreement might help in, in such situations too. Yeah, so you can imagine that Springer Nature has moved pretty cautiously with those nature titles and right. moving toward these open access agreements, but there have been two recent agreements, you know, with the Max Planck uh, Institute in Germany, their Springer Nature agreement now gives their authors the ability to publish in the nature journals as well as in the Springer oh. uh, journals. And California's new agreement, the UC system's new agreement, I'm pretty sure also covers the nature. And the outcome of all of that, right, is that just a couple months ago, Springer Nature for the first time actually put an APC price on publishing in nature, which, and it's around $10,000. Oh. So they have said all along that, you know, because of the rejection rate at these prestige journals, that the right. APC rate is gonna be super, super high, but they never said what it is. And right. I think that's actually, there's some transparency that's coming from this that is actually really helpful. Because right. when the libraries are paying for these really expensive subscriptions to these prestige journals and no one on campus sees that, there's no right. awareness of, of the, the, the cost behind all right. of this. But when, when faculty are actually given that choice, if you want to publish in open access in nature, it's gonna cost 10,000. If you wanna publish underneath this journal at you know, Cambridge, where the average APC is like $1,800, you know, we need price sensitivity by authors. They need to be able to see this because really $10,000 APCs are not really sustainable, I don't believe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. 
Yeah. Um, we, you know, we're probably two or three years out with doing anything with Springer Nature. I think science, of course, is a very different question, right? right. Um, because AAAS is, you know, what they've just announced is they're going to get short-term compliance with the Plan S funder requirements oh. by, by, by being more generous. Anyone who is funded by a Plan S author is going to have the right to deposit their article in a, in a repository. That's right. how they're going to get compliant. I've been part of several calls. I work with a group of um, kind of activist librarians in this space who have been proactive in reaching out to uh, you know, publishers and having these conversations. And we've had several meetings with the publishing director at AAAS on you know, how they might think about like the subscribed open model or a model that might actually work pretty well for AAAS. So I think look for science. <laughs> to probably do something in the coming years, I think that will be a pretty easy transition, you know, compared to, you know, libraries trying to figure out how to foot the bill for the nature uh, publishing on their campus. You know, for us, we don't publish that much in nature, so it wouldn't be a huge hit to us. But if you think about, um, you know, the, back to like the UC Berkeley's and these high research output institutions, you know, the cost of prestige publishing on those campuses is gonna be really prohibitive. Yeah. And we have a few more minutes. Kathy, I saw you had unmuted. Um, if you had a comment, we'd love to hear it or a question. Oh, I was just going to say I work for the Grants Hub and we're under the Vice President for Research. So we accept the applications for the Publication Subvention Program. And we had a question about a month ago about an open access request for Wiley. And I spoke with Abby and she helped me. By Good. Questions, so. Appreciated that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that the subvention grant is actually a nice um, companion program to the open access agreements that the library is doing. Um, you know, I showed that pie chart that had like 20 publishers on it. You know, we only have agreements with, you know, whatever, seven or eight of those. Um, so we still have of our top 20, you know, we still have like 12 agreements that we need to make. But if you get down to that that 15% pie slice, which is that long tail of publishers that we only publish with infrequently, there's a hundred publishers in that make up that 14%. And so the time it will take the library in order to make all of those agreements, I mean, we may never have, you know, direct agreements with all of those publishers. So I think something like the subvention grant program can pick up, you know. And, and I haven't talked to Jim Reese about this or to, to Peter about this, but you know, when based off of that conversation with the with the grant and with Wiley, I was thinking that you know the subvention grant will be very helpful in picking up the publishing for you know these many many you know the long tail of publishers that our faculty might publish in infrequently, so we can offer you know balanced campus wide support you know to publish where an author might want to publish because something we've been sensitive about is not wanting to create incentives for the author on where they publish. We feel like authors are in the best position to decide where their work should be published. And what we need to do is just figure out how to equally provide support to make that work open access. And I haven't mentioned this, but you know, this is all right in alignment with our land grant mission, right? We're supposed to create knowledge and then share it to make, you know, I win the world a better place. And so that sharing piece just fits so nicely, not just with open access, but with the open data um, and the open scholarship and the open science. So glad you're here. Kathy, you're, we consider you all one of our primary allies in this in this movement to make our content open. Thank you. Um, Abby? I think or, that'll be it for today, yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for stopping by today. I hope you appreciated the presentation. Again, feel free to reach out to Curtis or me if you have any questions about open access at Iowa State or want to learn more about this topic. Uh, next month's cafe is going to be about open education projects and support on campus. So if you're interested in learning more about open educational resources or open education broadly, you can feel free to visit for that one. Uh, next month's topic is going to be more of a casual conversation sort of mode. So if you're interested in that, please stop by. And for April, May, and June, we're still looking at topics. We have a couple of suggestions so far, but if you have one you'd like to push for, you can use our suggested topic page on our website uh, linked in the chat. So thank, thank you for coming. Thanks for coming, everybody.